Thank you very much. A uh, bit early to, you know, give me your hands, but thank you very much. Uh, very hopeful. Uh, now, just by show of hands, how many archaeologists are there in the room? Okay, quite a few. Right, okay. How many marine biologists or environmentalists? Okay. How many food lovers? Okay, that's better. Okay, okay. That, Gives me an idea about how this talk hopefully can fulfill your expectations if you have any of those, of course. As you can probably tell by my accent, I was born in Italy, I have a very strong Italian accent despite being here for nearly 20 years, thank you very much. <laughs> nearly 20 years, and um, but I remember when I was in my teens, I'm not going to be more specific than that, otherwise, you will guess my age. Uh, when I was in my teens, I saw the Mary Rose shipwreck being brought up on the surface, on the news, on the national news in Italy. And that's when I decided, number one, that I wanted to become a maritime archaeologist, and number two, that I wanted to go and work at the Mary Rose in Portsmouth and be able to actually deal with the archaeological timbers of uh, Henry VIII flagship. I don't know if you are aware of the wreck, but if you don't, go and pay a visit because it's an amazing wreck and an amazing museum as well. So many years later, and many mistakes later, I should add, I managed to fulfill my dreams. I became both a maritime archaeologist and I managed to go and work at the Mary Rose. I came over to UK to do a master's in maritime archaeology, and then I volunteered to go and um, help at the Mary Rose, and a few months later, I was offered a job to work on, a, a permanent job actually, to work on a um, European project which focused on the understanding of principles, biological, physical and chemical principles of shipwreck degradation in Europe. And that's where it all started basically. From there, this, um, the, the results of this project concluded that, number one, if there is wood archaeological or fresh in the exposed in the marine environment that is very likely to be degraded, attacked and therefore degraded by wood borers. The other result, quite important, was also that we identified and assessed the presence of wood borers in the brackish waters of the Baltic Sea. So that was also very interesting and very, um, it was European funded project so um, very important results as well. So, because of the experience on the European project, I then decided I was working at the Mary Rose, so I decided and proposed to do some specific monitoring of the Mary Rose site in the Solent. So, we put some sacrificial samples, we also raised some of the original timbers, the bow timbers, and I analyzed them. And I did, I applied the same methodology as per the European project. And the results with, um, after a few years, the results were quite important. With Portsmouth University, we did a, an identification of the wood boring creatures that attacked the wood. And we realized there was the presence of a particular borer, which is actually not indigenous of British waters. So that was quite uh, incredible, also because it's very aggressive, it's a very aggressive woodworm. But I will talk about this a little bit later on. So about a few years later, I uh, came to Bournemouth University, almost 10 years ago. I came to Bournemouth University and I wanted to do actually the same research as per the European project, as per the Mary Rose. And again, the results of that research uh, confirmed what I found on the Mary Rose, what we as a team found on the Mary Rose. So this borers, this relatively new borer, was actually present on a wreck in the, uh, um, in the approaches to Pearl Harbor, on a wreck we are excavating. So with this talk, what I'm trying to do is to combine the environment, the marine environment, the archaeology, and also with a little bit of a treat for food lovers. Uh, uh, the shipworms I'm going to include in this talk uh, concern the family of the Teridinidae. 
Uh, I will mention some Latin names, please don't worry, if you haven't studied Latin it's not a problem, it's just trying to give you uh, an understanding of my research. So the family of the Teredinidae is actually known for being very highly destructive wood borers. So they cause a lot of damage and this damage uh, can be internal to the wood, can be internal to the structure of the wood. Sometimes it's totally hidden and so it's not visible to the naked eye. As you can see from the top two pictures, uh, these were taken from a National Geographic um, article from in the 70s and uh, in San Francisco Bay where wood borers created a huge amount of degradation. An important one, structure of course, you can see the bridges, you can see also two people very leisurely trying to collect the shipworms of uh, underneath the pontoon, so uh, totally unaware of the risk of collapse potentially. Of course this had also severe financial implications, as you can imagine. So, how does this work? Basically, these wood boring creatures are released by the parents in the water at a larval stage. They then deposit on the wood surface and they start digging a little hole. And they are very, very tiny, both the larvae and the hole. You can barely see it. From this point onwards, they start developing their body and they start digging a tunnel inside the wood, as you can see in this picture here. So the body actually is an elongated body. It grows inside the wood and the exit hole, or the entrance hole in this case, is very, it's very, very tiny. Can you see the problem here? There's no going out. So they can get into the wood, but they cannot get out of the wood, so they are trapped inside. They dig tunnels along the grain of the wood because that's easier and it's softer. The tunnel is coated with a calcareous substance which protects the organism. Yet, despite their elongated body, they are always in contact with the external environment. And they monitor the characteristics of this, this environment to see if it actually is suitable for their living and surviving and reproducing activities. As you can see in the bottom pictures, they keep on attacking once they are released by the parents in the environment. The larvae are millions, not few numbers, but millions of larvae for every parent. And they keep on attacking, depending on the species, they keep on attacking the same wood that is present in that particular area until potentially there's no more wood left. And they are so smart, I like these creatures really, but they are so smart that their tunnels never cross another organism's tunnel. They never ever cross the path. Okay, I said that is that degradation, that the damage that they can cause can be deceiving. And here we have a 4th century BC Greek archaic shipwreck or timber from a shipwreck found in the Mediterranean off the coast of Sicily, which the appearance is actually quite uniform apart from a little bit of degradation on the bottom. The next slide, please. If you look at it from a totally different perspective, and again, that's what it looks like. It's completely and thoroughly honeycombed. The, wood, the original wood is actually very little. All you can see are those tunnels, this coated, calcareous coated tunnels. This is the next slide, please. So, this is what they look like, okay? Not very pretty, but depending on, uh, you know, which point of view you're looking at. So they have an elongated body, worm-like body, but they are actually not worms, they are mollusks. These, by the way, are the ugly one. The others are not much better anyway. <laughs> so the elongated body, uh, at one end we have the cephalic hood, and is a bivalve, okay? And you can see here the shell, one and the other. In the shell, if you can see at these 
scanning the electron micrograph, they present denticulated ridges. Basically, this is the way they dig into the wood. With the forward and rotatory movement, they dig in the wood and rust it. And in this way, they make bay tunnel longer and longer. So they look like serrated knives. They look like almost diverse knives. They're very, very sharp. This is so interesting that actually Isambard Brunel took inspiration exactly from these organisms in order to design a machine that would dig tunnels into the rock. And of course, the elongated body, at uh, about halfway through, we found the brood pouch. And as you can see here, there are thousands and thousands of larvae that sooner or later, this will be released in the environment. At the end of the body, there are two very important features, the palates and the siphons. These are couples, so we found two palates and two siphons. So the palates are like blades, which act as a door. So they are always at the very end of the animal, of the organism, and as soon as the organism detects something wrong in the environment, the palates shut, plug the hole, the siphons are retracted and the pallets shut so that the animal, the wood borer, can actually live in their tunnel for quite a long period of time until at least the environmental conditions, so for example, cold temperature, water temperature, or salinity, or um, oxygen in the water, return to the normal standard for the survival of the organism. The pallets are the only diagnostic feature, so only by using the, identifying the pallets you can actually identify exactly what kind of woodborne or sheepworms we are um, having on our wood. Then we have the siphons, again we have um, at the, uh, the very end we have two siphons, one is in current so for the nutrients and the other is excurrent for the waste and to release the larvae in the environment. And again, these are very important because they are in constant contact with the water. Uh, next slide, please. Whereas the Teredo Navalis is very common, so you find it very often and has been recorded for years and years on our coasts, and not just in the UK. The research that I mentioned before, both in, on the Mary Rose and on uh, the Swash Channel Wreck in Dorset, has identified this um, bed shipworm. So it's called Lyrodus pedicillatus, also known as black tip. And you can see why, because the palettes have black tips. The problem with this guy is the damage that it does. The larvae of the previous shipworm, once they are released in the environment by the parent, they are free swimmers for quite a few days. So they can actually, they are released in the environment and they can diffuse, they can actually swim away from the site where they are released from. The problem with this guy is that the larvae are not free swimmers, so they are ready to settle on the same site, time and time again. What does this mean? This means, of course, that if there is the presence of um, Lyrodus pedicillatus on a particular important archaeological site, this site becomes at high risk of degradation. Because, as you know, there are thousands of larvae released by every single parent. And this is a big problem. The next slide, please. So, this is about today, but what about in the past? Well, the first time that the word Torido was retrieved in uh, notice in written documents was in 446 by playwright Aristophanes, Greek Aristophanes, and, but that was only the first time. But maybe um, the 
ancient people didn't know the specifics about the wood borers, but they certainly knew about the damage, especially seafarers, they knew about the damage that these wood borers would cause to their ships. It was so common that even uh, poets like Pliny and Ovid, Alexander the Great, uh, were mentioning in their documents. And I actually, I have a, a testimony of uh, Christopher Columbus that I would like to read to you because it gives the exact idea of how dramatic is the presence of these wood borers. Uh, so he writes this letter in uh, uh, 1503, and it's a letter that he writes from uh, uh, in Jamaica, Jamaica, uh, to the king and queen of Spain. So he says, on the last day of April 1503, we left Veragua with three ships, intending to make our passage homeward to Spain. But as the ships were all pierced and eaten by the Toredo, we could not keep them above water. We abandoned one of them after we had proceeded 30 leagues. The two which remained were even in a worse condition than that, so that all the hands were not sufficient with the use of pumps and kettles and pans, pans to draw off water they came through, that came through the hole made by the worms. In this state, with the utmost toil and danger, we sailed for 35 days, thinking to reach Spain. And in the end of this time, we arrived at the lowest point of the Isle of Cuba. So as you can tell, it's quite scary thinking that you have sailed for 35 days and you've made very little progress and your ships are actually like colanders making a lot of water. I mentioned the Mary Rose at the beginning, and of course the Mary Rose was no exception to this. Um, I don't know how much you know about the Mary Rose, but it was um, found uh, by Alexander McKee, an historian, who in a publication at some point in the 70s, he wrote, he hypothesized that the Mary Rose sunk because of the damage by these wood borers. Now, if you have been, you probably haven't noticed, but this is one of the beams, it's protruding beams that it comes here, and it's all honeycombed. The poets were talking about sponge-like wood. It doesn't retain any, any water. It's all hollow inside. And this is what some of the beams are actually showing. Now, in the early, um, in around 2004, um, when I was at the Mary Rose, the archaeological team went diving on the site and some timbers were retrieved. These were the bow timbers, so quite large pieces of timber. They were put in a big storage area and left there for days. When I went to analyze them, I saw the siphons still waving about in the air, despite being totally dry. As you can see, the, the area is very dry. So the, the hardship, the, the strength of this borer is something else. When I do my analysis on, on the wood being sacrificial or archaeological wood, I treat the timber where I do uh, x-rays analysis, for example, and you would think that, you know, that would have an impact. Absolutely not. If there are living organisms, these are quite resilient. Okay, so now to test your attention, I would like to ask you if you see anything strange on this timber. While you think about it, I just would like to mention, I would like to be thought-provoking. Can you think about the damage? How many wrecks are around, not just around the UK, but dotted everywhere in the world? And can you see the damage that every single wreck can undergo if the presence of this wood borer are there? We have a wreck on our doorstep, the Swashtown wreck site, which I mentioned before. 
another very important because it, it represents the early signs of globalization. It was a high status merchantman, Dutch merchantman. High status because the, there are a number, amongst other things, there are a number of carved timbers which we nicely call the merman, including a nearly nine, 8.5 meters long rudder with a beautiful car feature, um, like it's, a, it's a, the face of a warrior with a helmet and big moustaches, very nice. So now that you have the time to think, can you see anything? No, not many divers here, so can, you, can I bring it out of the water? What about now? Yep, yeah, and again. Okay, if we look closely, we can see an early sign of wood borer's degradation. And every single one of those holes have been made by one larvae, different larvae, one hole, one larvae. So you can see how much damage and what is the extent of the threat that our shipwrecks can go under. So, um, I took this slide, this picture here, on my very first dive on that specific wreck, the Swash Channel wreck site. Now, the calcareous tube that you can see there, only the exposed part of it is about 60 centimeters long. 60 centimeters long is about probably this high. And that's only what is visible. But I'll have you know that these borers, these shipworms, some of them, can grow up to 1.8 meters in length, which is taller than me. I'm 165, so. Um, another um, aspect of it is that I mentioned only two species of the Pteridinidae family, but actually there are more. And very often the problem is, when you analyze archaeological wood, is that in order, you can do the x-ray, there is a beautiful um, example of a, an x-ray that I've done on one of the timbers of the Mary Rose, from the Mary Rose. It's very nice, but it doesn't help very much with the identification, because in order to identify the borer, you need to break open the timber, but we're talking about archaeological timbers here. So the value of them can be very high. Do you really want to destroy something like the merman that I showed you earlier on, just in order to understand what borer has caused that damage? It's quite a difficult answer. So I've spoken a little bit about um, maritime archaeology. I've spoken a little bit about um, the environment. These borers, the size of these borers increase also depending on the environmental conditions. And now I promised a little food treat. So, in some areas in the world, these borers are eaten. They are considered a delicacy. They are cultivated in mangroves. So in places like Australia, for example, or the Philippines, it is actually a very highly sought food to have, kind of food to have. Can I have the next slide, please? <laughs> Apologies, I know it's just before dinner. <laughs> so, this is the good, by the way. <laughs> so, there is, in the Philippines, there is a, a dish called the tamilok. And I checked with um, a student whose origin is from the Philippines last year, a master's student. And she said that she actually never tasted it. But it is true, her mother used to cook this food. And that is 
on the top picture there. But as you can see, you can also have, if you are more fussy, you can have also a sheep um, soup, maybe. Now, anybody wants to try it? No? Any brave person? <laughs> Some of my former students volunteered, but I never took them upon the offer. Okay, so because you don't want to try it, I actually have a little treat for you, which is not a biscuit. It's actually first-hand evidence. That's why I wanted to give this talk by bringing some evidence. Can I ask somebody to come and help me, please? Okay. So, first of all, don't open it yet, as yet. First of all, when, and I apologize for the people behind the bar, but as soon as this box will be open, there will be a nice scent spreading. <laughs> it's not my new perfume. Okay. Secondly, um, it's a unique opportunity uh, to show you what I deal with on, in my research. This is a fragment of a timber, you can open it now, from the actual shipwreck. The, the swash channel right side. So, thank you very much. I'm not very keen in passing it around, but I can put it on the table and you can come and have a look. And as you can see, there is the calcareous lining here, which is very strong, by the way. But the original surface is totally degraded. So go back and think about the merman or the rudder. If it had finest carving, these would have been completely lost because of these borders. And uh, thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions.